uh, we will use Menti, uh, but you can uh, ask questions in Zoom. Uh, so you can ask questions in the Mentimeter, but you can ask questions in the Zoom chat as well. Um, doesn't matter. And I was planning to start a little bit more advanced things, but before we do that, I want to check like where you are in, in the course. And as we are progressing through the course, if I go to the wiki, and if you go to lectures, um, last week, uh, that was um, older than last week, actually. Um, so there is a, a typo. Uh, this should be, um, you know, more than five. That we had the checkpoint chapter five earlier. Uh, so how far you are with the reading the book? Who is up to chapter five? And you guys, what chapter are you on? Uh, if you if you're not reading the book, then I encourage you to read the book. Uh, the book is very slow, like it kind of explains the concepts in a very uh, childlike way, but that's fine. Uh, the, the thing is that Haskell has some easy concepts, which are really easy to grasp, and it has kind of a more complex com concept. And the more complex concepts, I even kind of grasp it yet. Like there are some things that I'm like still grasping, right? Uh, so Haskell is kind of a long-term uh, commitment to learn more and more advanced things. Uh, the, the basic things are relatively easy. You can kind of go quickly through them, but the more advanced ones, they you may need to read some chapters more than once. Um, I, I read the book like twice myself. I'm a bit of a slow learner. So um, I you kind of need to spend some time with the book. So I do encourage you to go um, uh, into the Learn Your Haskell book. Uh, the new Haskell book, you can read it online. Um, and then chapter five is like recursion. So up to here, all of that is relatively simple. Uh, you can go through it very fast, um, but you do still need to practice a little bit. And then um, we started about carry functions last week. Uh, that starts to be a little bit more compl complicated. So all of that, again, it's not hard, but it's like you need to spend some time with this. And then, um, and then those um, those concepts here um, and zippers that is uh, harder. So we will talk a little bit about some fundamentals today. Even and they you may need to revisit them multiple times. It's a bit like layers. So you may grasp them on some level, and then you kind of go somewhere. You can start using it, and then you have to come back and like relearn it, right? <clears throat> so it's not a very long book. It's uh, it, it's easy to read. It's kind of yeah. Um, all right. So let's go. Let's go with some quiz questions. So ask me anything at any time, and then. Um, Mark, how familiar are you with the simple things? So function declaration and function definition. Uh, and then it's like basically the same with uh, where case, if pattern matching and so on, like how far you are, how, you know, how familiar are you with, the, with those things? Where would you place yourself? Um, obviously we're looking for people to be on that side. <laughs> But usually you have kind of a bimodal, uh, which you know we see that it is a little bit bimodal. Um, <clears throat> those are kind of a simple things. You you should be here by now. You should definitely be here. Uh, with these, you should also be somewhere here. And uh, there are some people who haven't started yet. So there is like a, a, a strong skew in the left as well, right? Okay, not too good. Uh, let's move on. So recursion, uh, chapter six is about recursion. We did a little bit of about recursion and then the assignment one, like Haskell one is all 
mostly about recursion actually. Let me kind of recall Pascal one. Length of the list, member, sum. We're gonna do some today. Uh, reversing polydromes. Yeah, and some recursion calls. It's easy. All of that is, is easy. Uh, the only thing that is kind of complicated is the testing. Um, but you don't need to learn everything how it is done. It's just be able to use it. <clears throat> All right, so how we are here. Um, so there are, um, I will talk a little bit more about it later, but there are two types of uh, uh, recursive calls. Uh, we have um, kind of a tail, tail recursion and a general recursion. The general recursion carries kind of a growing amount of stuff as you recurse, right? So um, if you kind of are storing some partial results uh, and they kind of are not evaluated until you finish and you have to roll it all back, then it's kind of a general recursion, right? Uh, a tail recursion means you kind of compacted the state and uh, every time you kind of recursing, uh, you don't grow the amount of space that you need to store what you're currently recursing into, right? Uh, that's kind of a tail recursion. So it means that you have um, uh, kind of a constant space for keeping the size of what, how much you kind of, how many times you recurse into, right? Um, and then unrolling the, uh, the calls, it depends. Like sometimes it's kind of, simple sometimes you have to think a little bit about it and it, it's like how would you convert like an implementation with a recursive call to an implementation with a loop like with a um, iteration instead of recursion right okay um so let us uh, learn a little bit today about uh the basics and uh let's do some coding okay so we will learn by doing and I, I mean, you will be doing. Um, and I prepared some uh, simple tasks. And the simple tasks are in a form of a function which takes some parameters and the function is called f. Uh, and then you write the body, right? Uh, so um, you don't have to tell, uh, so let's, let's go here. So you don't have to say f and then specify the type. Like you don't you don't do that you, you you go straight into f a you know list or something uh, and then oops uh, and then you say equals and then you say what what happens most of the most of the programs that you want to run are sort of one liners uh, if you need multiple lines then think how could you do it in one line like how would you do a one liner right so what we're looking for is this kind of pattern. Um, for some of the tasks. And the first task is, of course, hello world. Um, but hello world with a twist. <laughs> uh, you will call fn and you will print hello world n times, right? So, how would you do that in Haskell? So, do this, and then when you're ready, uh, submit it into the, the menti, like as a Kind of one liner if you use multiple lines submitted as multiple lines. <clears throat> uh, while you're doing it, um, one good thing to try is to run um, GHC. So let me make it bigger. Let me clear this. And then if you write GHCI, then what you can do is you can basically try out one-liners in the kind of uh, inter interactive shell, right? So you can uh, create your function f takes n and then do something and then call f, uh, like, you know, print n. So I can define f and I can call f10 and then it prints 10, right? As trivial as that. Uh, so you can kind of uh, explore like how your one-liner would look like and if, if it will work. Uh, because if you have multiple functions that you need to call, sometimes you need the brackets, sometimes you need the dollar sign and you need to get it right, right? Um, the other thing is you can always say, I, you can ask what is print doing, right? 
So print kind of converts something into a IO action. So you can, you can use that. Uh, you can ask what uh, map is doing uh, and so on. So you can kind of get a bit of a help um, for things like, like here. So what we want is we want a function fn, fn, which will print um, something on the screen five times, so n, n times. So the, the first one, um, <clears throat> yeah, let's, um, let's wait a little bit more. So, so don't, don't name the functions, just use F, right? So don't, don't say uh, like hello words or whatever, just, just use F because then it's easier to compare uh, different implementations because they will all use the same uh, function name. Um, that's one comment. And the second one is you need to print it on the screen, right? So you need to actually like use print or put string line. line. Uh, so you have uh, to, uh, you could use print or you could use um, put string line um, to actually dump something onto the screen, right? Uh, just returning a string from a function is not. Um, so hello. Okay, so look, I will define f as this and I call f. Uh, and then I will define f as returning hello. Hello, and I will call F, and it kind of seems to be doing the same thing, but it's only kind of here because, in fact, like when calling F, it doesn't print anything to the screen, right? If you call it like if you compile it into a binary, then this program would not actually print anything to the screen, whereas this one would, right? All right, so can you submit multiple times? Can you submit multiple times? Perfect. So try to submit one more time and using using kind of F notation. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so we have, um, we have uh, a working example. So let's, let's try it out. Um, So we define fn as um, if n is bigger than zero, then print hello world. Uh, else, uh, no, um, hello world, and we call f n minus one, and then else we close, we we finish, right? So we can print nothing. So that, that, that will not work. Um, why it will not work yet? So what's, um, what is the problem with, with this one? Yeah, say it again. That we didn't define, uh, declare the function. Um, now you, I mean, it will try to infer what types it, it is. It could infer wrong, but it will try to infer the type. Uh, the, the problem is with the then uh, expression. So what, uh, how we should interpret that, that sequence of instructions. There is no problem with this one because it's just one, one, one uh, instruction and it will evaluate to something and that's what else will return. But what about this one? Mm 
Yep. So we, we need some parentheses. We also need to remember that when we said uh, then, then whatever is in then has to be an expression which evaluates the value because that is the return of it, right? Uh, so you have to, that, that, that is probably like a typical uh, way of thinking of the kind of like the imperative programmer that do this, do this, do this, right? But here you, you, you cannot think like this, like do print this and then do this. Like to sequence things is already complicated. Like to, to sequence stuff in Haskell, that's already like advanced stuff. <laughs> you, you have to call something, right? And calling something kind of does something, right? Uh, so um, you, um, so the idea is correct, but like if I try to run it, it will kind of blow up, right? So it, it, it says, whoa, whoa, what are you doing, right? So let's check if it's helpful. So, so it says, um, um, the function print is applied to three arguments. So print and this, right? So you see print is applied to hello world F and N minus one, three arguments. So we already having problems. Like we, we say, no, actually print is only applied to this argument. And then we have this stuff going on, right? The, the, the second call. So that's already a little bit problematic um, because this, the whole thing here needs to evaluate to a single thing. Like it's a single call, single expression. Okay, so um, let me keep that and let me um, let me do something else here. Uh, Proc two o six. Um, hello, Pascal. Okay, so. It would be easier. I mean, the idea is, is okay. The idea is okay, uh, but we need to kind of deal with this um, with this messiness of the of the then close, right? Uh, that part is a little bit uh, complicated. So let's see who else tried. Um, yeah. So this one is is okay for the uh, then close. But in Haskell, you need to have then and else clauses, like if always evaluates to something. So this is illegal in Haskell because you, you have to have else and uh, then and else, right? Um, right, so let me uh, go here. Oh, come on. Right, so let's make it bigger. Okay, so the idea, like, let's keep in mind this idea of iterating, calling like recursively f of n uh, multiple times until f of, of n is zero, right? Uh, so then what we could do is, um, so let's, so f out n and we know that for zero we do nothing so for zero we say print nothing right so we already dealt with the case of zero right um so let's uh let's do the generic case for n and now we basically doing what so we kind of unrolling the if such that we don't need to deal with this then close being complex right so if we already dealt with the case of zero that means here 
we are already in the other case, right? And in the other case, what we were doing? So we were doing two things. We were printing hello world and then calling a function, right? Calling that function again, right? So we kind of need to sequence kind of two things to happen. We need to print and then do something, do the recursive call. So how you do that in Haskell? We will learn about it later. Like that's one of those more advanced things, but you generally do that by the kind of a do statement, which allows you to sequence things and do certain things in sequence, right? So we can do print uh, hello world and then call f with n minus one, right? So that would be kind of a Haskell way of expressing the previous code in a way without the if statement such that we don't sequence things in the if statement. Can you sequence things in the if statement? Yes, you can. So if you don't want to do it this way, it will be a little bit more messy. So if I um, comment that out and I say, if uh, n is bigger than zero, then do this and then else, uh, you know, do uh, print nothing, right? That, that's also legal, but it's hard to do in one line, right? Uh, because I'm doing this do thing and do thing is sequencing two things and we're doing that and that in sequence, right? Is it clear now? All right. And what is the inferred type? So I didn't specify the type, but Haskell worked out that uh, T that I'm passing in is some sort of a number, right? It, it says, okay, T must be a number. It doesn't say it's an integer. It doesn't say it's an integral. It just says it's a number. And then it says the result of, the, of calling F is IO action, right? Which, which it is, because if you look into the print, um, so what is print? Uh, a print takes something that is showable and then generates string out of it and generates an IO action, right? All right, so uh, do you like this one more? Or do you, the, do you like the one without the if statement more? Do you like this one? Is this one easier to read? Or is this one um, easier to read without the uh, if? Any votes? Which one you like more? Sorry? I like this one more as well. Yeah, it's kind of obvious, right? It, it, it isolates the obvious case of zero. And then the rest is very obvious what happens. With the if, you kind of need to keep track of well, you know, a little bit more context, right? So this one is sort of nice. Uh, would you override the default uh, declaration of the, of the statement? You probably would. So you probably would say f takes an int and produces an IO action, right? You probably go with that. All right, so let's call it F1, such that I will kind of call the next one F. And how could you do that in one line? So if we did, um, if we did the if statement, or if we did the um, this one with pattern matching, we're still using multiple lines, and that's. Um, um, that's not necessary. You, we can do that in one line. So the offending bit is the do, like the do, the, the sequencer, like uh, it says, uh, do this and then do this, right? So how can we get rid of explicitly doing this calculation and doing something kind of um, n times. What, do you know the, the construct that you could use? You probably don't, otherwise you would use it. So let's go and say, um, 
Um, yeah, how would I search for this? Um, yeah, let's go for Google. So how, how okay um that's that might, that might not be the best way of uh, guiding you so um how would you do this in uh in imperative programming you would use a loop so how how um sorry how would you like how would you uh, uh, how would you write it in Golang? So for n, so we uh, um, you could use the you know uh, the, the full 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 loop like you could say for n uh, from zero no no because n is the parameter so for index equals zero. Uh, I less than n, and then I plus plus do something, right? And then do something would be like equivalent of print hello world, right? So now you see that what we're doing, we're just doing the action that we need to do, and the state is kind of managed by this loop thing, right? Um, if you were kind of to be a bit nicer, you could say, well, I don't want to be doing that for. Um, I don't really need to keep track of the um, of, of the actual number, right? Because I don't care what the i is, uh, so I don't I don't care what the counter is, and I don't care what you're giving to me. All I care is that I have a range uh, uh, of something uh, which is like from zero to n, right? So I can, um, if you can generate like a, a list of numbers from zero to n, uh, then you could kind of do this. Uh, uh, so, so from either from one to n or from zero to n minus one, right? Because we want n times. So uh, if we do it like this, uh, then uh, you kind of don't care what those things are. You're just kind of iterating n times, right? So how, how can you do that in Haskell? How can you iterate over something kind of uh, n times? Um, what do you know so far that you could use? So there are a couple of um, constructs, right? One that you already know is map, right? So you, you already know a map. Um, so if I have a list, if I have a list of numbers one, two, three, right? I have a list um, of three numbers. If I want to have a list of um, n numbers, I would go like this, right? So if I have f of, of n, I could, um, so f of 10 gives me, um, Um, yeah, it doesn't work too well. So let's do, I'm not sure if, the, um, I think. Yeah, I, I, it, like the interpreter is a little bit um, cumbersome, but you kind of know, know what I mean, right? So I, I let's say I have a I have a list, so I have a list L, and the list of L is um, one, two, three. Then if I want to do something with that list, I can do I can call a function, uh, which kind of does something with that list. So my function will kind of uh, take an argument. Uh, so I have a lambda function. It takes an, an argument, which is an X and, and does something, right? And then if I say print 
um, x, then I will have um, I will have um, so that that is correct, but um, the I/O action which the print is trying to do is not showable, right? So let me change it to put chain line. Um, yeah, let's let's do that in the in here. So that would be the um, the uh, Golang way. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to have Fn, and we're trying to map a certain action um, which takes an x and does something to to x. Um, in our case, it put put string line um, of um, show. We need to convert the number to a string because put string line takes a, a string and then we pass it uh, our um, our list. And our list is uh, one, two, three. Okay, so then I can, you can see that my function takes P uh, and produces an array of I/O actions, which is which is basically this uh, doing this. Um, so if I save it and if I go and if I go I and I call it stack. Um, yeah, that should be fine. So tell me what F is doing. Uh, no, F, uh, I haven't exported it. So let's export it. So F takes P. So if I call F 10, um, yeah, it's, it's the same problem as we had before because of the, like I have now a, a list of IO actions and I cannot really show it. So uh, what we can do is we can, um, we can build and run it. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not actually calling it. Anyway, um, the idea is that you can, um, you can uh, using map, you can iterate over a list and do something, right? So now what you need to do is you need to have a list which has n num elements. And instead of using anything from that list, you do something with that list and then you print kind of hello, right? That would be, um, a mechanism to sort of do this, right? And then how would you generate a, a list? How, how can you generate a list of n items in Haskell? So generate a list of n items. So we want um, f n and it returns a list of n of something like n ones, for example. So replicate 10 one, give us a list of 10 ones, right? A replicate repeats the second argument and puts, puts it into a list of some of n numbers, right? So if I say f, n and if i say replicate n one i will get a list of n ones and then if i say map a function 
which I don't care what those ones are. All I care is that you print hello world. What will happen? What will this code do? It will do this body for each once for each item of the list, right? So it will, because map kind of executes this for each of the element. So if N is, um, so if F I call it with 10, um, it works, but as, as I was saying, it doesn't know how to show the list of IO actions, right? Um, so because now my map produces a list of IO actions, which are the prints, right? If I change it to put string, it does the same. Uh, and it's also a list, so it kind of doesn't know how to how to do it. Um, and the list is kind of lazy because I am not doing anything with the list, so the list is there, but I, I haven't actually executed the, the IO actions, right? Anyway, the point was not about IO, the point was about kind of uh, using, uh, using something which allows you to do something multiple times without kind of recursion. And map is one of those. Uh, map is one of the mechanisms that you can use to um, to do something with the list and then um, have it done multiple times and then you can do it in one line right um, all right so I think that is um, yeah yeah mm-hmm So in terms of performance, like uh, there are um, uh, normally when you when you're doing Haskell, you should not worry about performance first, right? So you just do it, you express it the way that it's concise and it's kind of idiomatic, and then if it runs too slow, then you deal with it. Uh, so don't worry about performance initially. And Haskell is a different beast in terms of lists compared to any programming language you've used because List is a fundamental data structure that Haskell has to use, and they do a lot of tricks to kind of retain the memory and to kind of manipulate the pointers for you such that you don't waste in space. Uh, and also you kind of don't computing something that has been already computed once. Uh, so they use kind of a red black trees behind the scene and they trying to sort of uh, reuse kind of a tree like structures which are represent uh, a representation of your lists. In, in kind of an efficient way. So constructing lists, destroying lists, combining lists, and so on. In normal programming languages, that's always kind of, you have to pay attention to, to your memory allocations and everything. Here, the runtime system does a lot of work for you. And most of the time it's, it's very efficient. Uh, there are cases where you need to fine tune it, but you should not worry about it initially, right? Um, Oh, sorry, I didn't notice uh, people texting, like uh, talking about uh, in the in the chat. So um, yeah, so the, there are some brackets that I needed. Um, uh, what's the difference between using put string line and uh, instead of print? Um, no real reasons. Um, you depending on the spec, depending what you want to achieve, like a uh, uh, put string put string line expect the string. So you need to show like it has to, you have to convert manually what you're trying to print um, into the uh, screen using the show. Print does the, the, the show for you uh, and it is effectively the same. Uh, it, it kind of does the show and then print line. So no big difference, a little bit of a star, um, um, style choice, I guess. So this is like a sanity check. Like, uh, do you know how to do print hello world and times on the screen now? Um, so uh, you, if, even if you didn't know, uh, speak like right now after the explanations, if you kind of could do it uh, with small mistakes or yeah. 
So that's that's how we will run it. Like after each um, each question. So let's move on. We spent way too much on the hello world. So uh, lists. How familiar you are with lists and operations on lists? So the, the lists have a lot of operations. You can do, as I said, Haskell. One of the fundamental uh, data structures is a list and they have a lot of facilities to deal with lists. Uh, so the first one is more generic. The second one is, okay, do you know head, tail, length, how to get the particular item out of the list, how to do the sublist, uh, how, how to use this, um, um, how to trim the list. And then what is list comprehension? All right, so again, we are not kind of on the right-hand side. Um, so let me talk a little bit about list comprehension first. What is list comprehension? A list comprehension is a mechanism which you probably know from, from Python, if you ever program in Python, which allows you to deal with a kind of a generating manipulating and, um, and converting lists into other lists, right? So of course we have a map. So I can map a given function to a list and manipulate the list this way and express the logic of, of how I'm manipulating it in the, in the function f. But if, you, if a language has a list comprehension, then usually it is much easier. And in Haskell, a list comprehension has, uh, kind of a shape like a list. And then you have the left-hand side, which is the sort of uh, the output, what the new list will contain. And then you have a bar, and then you have the generator and conditions, right? Um, so the generator and conditions are kind of expressions which are evaluated to produce something that you want to end up with, right? Um, so let's let's make let's let's make it concrete. So let's generate uh, a list L again, which is uh, replicate ten times one. So I have uh, L is like uh, 10, 10 ones. And now I want to um, I want to kind of uh, generate something out of that list, right? Let's let's say um, you want to double each element. Uh, and you don't want to use a map. So I could use a map and I could say uh, multiply by two and call like this, right? And that works like using a map, but I, I can achieve the same using list comprehension. So I, I would say, I will have a new list. And in the new list, X is multiplied by two and X comes from L, right? So now this is a generator and it kind of loops over the L and generates me each item from L. And then this is the output and it kind of mu multiplies the item by two and leaves it in the, in the list, right? So if I execute that, I also have 10 twos, right? Um, so you can uh, add conditions. So you can say there are certain conditions like um, X must be bigger than one, right? And then if I do this, what will happen? I will have an empty list at the end because none of the X's matches the condition. Therefore, none of the X's is generated into output, which means that is never executed, which means I end up with empty list, right? How would you do the condition with the map? Like if you, if you want to do this, if you want to say, uh, multiply everything by two, but only if the item is bigger than uh, two, bigger than one. Well, you could do it, but now the function would be much more complicated because I have to say, I have to take X and the function is if uh, X is bigger than one, then do this, do X times two, else, uh, else what? Nothing, right? Nil. So 
we have a little bit of a problem uh, because how can I express nothingness? Uh, it's kind of, uh, you see, it's kind of our initial mapping kind of breaks down. So list comprehension to the rescue, very easy, very kind of expressive, deals with kind of an empty case naturally, right? All right, so task for you. Knowing what you know now. Um, Okay, trivial. You have to define F, which takes a list of ints, presumably negative and positive, and then you need to change it such that it produces uh, only absolute values of the of the list. So the return value is a list, uh, but you have um, you have to turn them into absolute values. And the break is now, so I will leave leave it to you. Um, let's have 10 minutes break. So that's the key. And the exercise is this one. Excellent.
All right. Uh, let's continue. So we have some some answers. Um, so this one and this one is correct, but th this one has a typo, like the parameter is called LST. So you should use LST like here. So this is perfect. That's a, a correct answer. Uh, that's perfect also. Uh, how do you know that ADS exists? Well, we need to go to Google and search for it, absolute. Yeah, so we see there is an ADC, ABS, um, um, which takes a number and it, uh, you know uh, produces the absolute value. So there is um, absolute, but that's about file paths. So the function that we were looking for is a ABS. And if we search for it, so if we say, uh, in our case, ABS X, it works. What is ABS? It says, well, it's defined in the numbers and it takes a number and returns the absolute value. So perfect. So that's solved. Um, so then the next question is how many of you were able to do that? I am reading the questions now in the chat. So if anyone has questions, just uh, ask. No, that's depressing. Come on, it was so easy. Like why people cannot still do that? Uh, like you, you didn't know how to do it, but you know now, right? Hopefully, excellent. So next one is a little bit harder. So let's go a little bit more. And uh, we basically have now a combination. So we are passing an end list and we want to filter all the items which are less than n. Uh, I mean, we want to filter out all the numbers which are bigger and leave the ones which are less than n in the, in the uh, returning, returned list. Right. So now everybody should got it right. Now you should you should know. Okay, while you're doing it, I will show you a couple of uh, hacks. So one is in uh, Golang, if I want to have a list of, uh, if I want to have a list of 1000 ones, or a, a slice or array of 1001 numbers, like number one, how would, how would I do that? Which is? So, um, so let's say we have a Golang and I want to have a list which is 1000 ones, okay? Um, so I would say make an, uh, a slice, slice of ints and I would say I want 1000 of them. And the problem is it generates 1000 of an empty ints which are zero, not one, right? And now I need to have a loop. So now I have to say, you know, for item for item in range list, I need to initialize it, right? Um, uh, there is no kind of a convenient way for just generate and initialize a kind of a, a, a list with a particular item, right? So in Haskell, um, if I want to have, um, Sorry, if I want to have uh, a thousand ones, uh, you've learned that I just do replicate, replicate thousand times one, and I have a list, you know, of thousand ones. And it's the same if I want something else, zero, you know, 
so that's that's easy. Um, there is kind of a list notation, which is a shortcut for uh, generating lists. So I can say I want the list from zero to ten, and that gives me a list from zero to ten inclusive, right? So the lower bound, where is my mouse? Yeah. Lower bound and upper bound are inclusive, uh, and I can generate easily a list of certain size. I can do, okay, I can generate a list from one to 10, but that's kind of trivial. What I can do is I can say zero, two, and 10. And what that will do, it will use the step between the first two elements to generate like zero, two, four, six, blah, 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 right? It's not super um, intelligent. So basically only works really for the, for the kind of a steps, uh, which are, like round numbers uh, and then you have the kind of the upper limit but what you can do is you can kind of uh <laughs> yeah I should not do that you, you can do this right so you can say my list is actually an infinite list of all even numbers from zero and you can do that you can have a list which is a list which is kind of infinitely long right so if I call length on it, like if I, I say, what, what's your length? Uh, what's gonna happen? It, it's gonna hang, right? It's gonna keep counting forever. Uh, but you can kind of operate on infinite lists, right? So you can, for example, say, uh, I want to take only first 10 numbers out of that list, right? So if you say take 10 out of this list, it gives you the first 10 numbers out of this infinite list, right? So there are kind of uh, easy ways of generating kind of iterators for your map or for your folds or for your kind of processing to replace kind of recursive calls into something that just operates on lists, right? Okay, so coming back to this one, we want a resulting list with only smaller numbers. So this is a perfect answer. Whoever answered that, that's correct. That's really good. This one is a correct answer. Uh, this one is a correct answer. Uh, we're not printing. So th this is just like a filter, a list of ints and output only those. Well, yeah, okay, output is a little bit, um, could be treated as outputting as print. Uh, so then uh, this would, um, uh, that's a wrong, wrong code anyway, because we want to run a test on each of the item of the list uh, and not comparing n to, to a list. Like this is a number, n is a number, and list is a list. You could compare the n to a length of the list, but not to a list itself, right? Um, so th this one is wrong uh, because you would need to map some form of behavior uh, onto the, the list, right? And then um, you could use a filter. Yeah, so this is, this is also fine because what we're doing is we sort of are calling um, a filter function. So let's check what filter does. And filter returns a bool um, I mean, filter takes a function which takes uh, an item and returns a bool and then con converts a list to a smaller list only for those items that have that condition uh, matched, right? So the condition is, the condition needs to be a function which evaluates to, to bool, to true or false. And in, that, in our case, it's less than n. Uh, and then we sort of are filtering the, all the items uh, out, um, so so it, it should be fn equals right like like here fn list and fn equals uh, to to properly do that, or you could just do it in the list comprehension without the f. So that one is also correct. This one is kind of a fancier way of doing it, and if you were to be kind of doing it with the fancier way, then probably doing a map is better. So you'd say uh, filter me all the like you would say this. So F and list would say map filter this 
onto a list. Um, and because you are um, yeah, you need to group stuff. So you need to do this. Um, um, no, no, actually you didn't map because a uh, filter takes a uh, filter takes a, a list. So we need to do this. Right, so now if I say filter me everything uh, smaller than two from the list, which is zero, one, two, three, then I have zero and one only, right? So a filter takes two arguments, uh, the Boolean function, which um, returns bool, uh, and then a list. And this Boolean function is a function of one argument, right? So it's a unary function. Um, what is the less than? How many parameters less than takes? How many? Two, perfect. So this is a two params function, which we call, how we call those functions? Binary, right? So binary function. Um, and then uh, if I say, less than 10, what's that one? Now it's a unary function because this one only takes one parameter and it's a kind of a carried function from the uh, less than, right? I kind of created a carry, perfect. All right, this one went well, we're making progress. So a check. Start quiz. Yeah, I'm looking for kind of a good answers on the left hand side. You can use filter, you can use map, you can use list comprehensions. Depends. Like uh, it's a little bit about your style, it's a little bit about con conciseness, uh, how you want to express it, right? Good, we're kind of making some progress. The, the dead bar is going down, good. Nice, all right, so next one. Um, whoa, scary stuff. Um, so how familiar you are with map? How familiar you are with zip? And whether you've done anything with folds? Again, uh, we didn't cover uh, zips and folds yet, but you might know it from other programming languages. You might use it in JavaScript or you might have used it somewhere. Um, map, you already know, uh, at least I hope you know. Um, and it's kind of present in Java, it's present in JavaScript and um, it's not really present in Golang, but um, is it? I don't know if map. Um, to be honest, um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I will check it, but I, I don't, I don't think I've used it in going. But it usually is used. It's called um, apply or map. It's kind of a, a, a very useful construct, a uh, zip. All right, so we have a skew towards the left hand side. Okay, so let me explain what zips do. Uh, there are two var variations of zips. There is a zip and zip width, okay? Uh, let's look into zip first. So what is zip? Uh, look, zip takes a list and another list and produces a single list which is a tuple of elements from both of the lists, right? So let's have two lists. Let's have a list uh, L1, which is from uh, one to 10. And let's have L2, which is a list from 11 to 20. And then let's zip them together. So let's zip L1 and L2. 
And yeah, sorry, that's a very good point. So when we zip them, uh, you obtain tuples, uh, which are first element from the first list, first element from the second list, second element from the first list, second element from the second, and so on and so on. So if you have two lists, a zip works like a zipper. It kind of uh, just kind of pairs all the lists like items into a pair, right? Um, and that's how, how it does it. And then you end up with the pair. So if I, I zip those two lists into a result, into the result L, and then I say, give me the, uh, the zero of element, uh, then it gives me a tuple. It gives me one 11, right? It's a tuple. Um, and then how do I get to one? Have you worked with tuples? We didn't work with tuples. So there is, a, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's look for it. So there is a call called first, called F, and given a tuple, it gives you the first item, right? So what's the second? Like if I want to get B, what would that be? Right. Given a tuple, it gives you the second one, right? So now, knowing that, if I go to my result and I get the first element, and if I say, give me the second one, I should get 11, right? But I need to separate uh, because second takes one element, which is a tuple. And uh, if I don't have this, um, if I don't have this, it kind of takes, um, it thinks, it takes three arguments, right? But that's not true. I can group it by uh, parentheses as well. So if I do this, I get 11. If I say, give me the first, I will get one. All right, so that's easy. We covered zips. Um, zip width, all right. So information, zip width. Zip width is a little bit more complex because it takes a function as a first argument and the function takes two parameters and produces a third uh, and the two parameters it takes can be of type a and b and it can produce completely arbitrary thing c at the end and then it takes two lists and produces a list of c's right so like, let's say uh first list is of numbers the second list is of uh, strings the third list can be io actions or whatever you want right not, none of the list needs to be linked with each other. With zip is the same, right? So if I have, um, so we have our, remember we have L1, which is uh, from one to 10. And let's have another list, which is like one, uh, two, right? So the second list is uh, shorter. It only has two amper, uh, items and they are strings. And let's call it LS. Uh, so now I have L1, which is this long list, and I have LS, which is that short list. I can zip them together. I can zip L1 with LS. But because the second one is shorter, after hitting the second element, I don't have any but nothing to zip with, right? Which means I'm, I'm stop zipping, right? So you always stop zipping in the shorter list, right? If I turn them around, if I list LS and L1, what's going to happen? I am just have the, the, the tuples swapped around. I will have one, one and two, two, right? So I have string first. And as you see, I have a string and a number. Can I have a list which has a string and a number? Can I have list like this? No, I cannot. That's illegal. Uh, the type of the list has to be like, um, Let's say I have a list, right? So uh, the type of L is that it has some items of type A and the type A has to be the same for all the items, right? So the type of any of the items dictates like all the other items. So I cannot mix two different types, but with the tuple, um, so let's, let's take this, um, Tuple, which we had, which was the R, the zeroth element from R. And if I say, what is the type of this tuple? It says, well, uh, it's a number. 
uh, and the number, uh, and they are enumerable, but they are both numbers, right? And then what we had, um, yeah, we had this one. So let's do zip. We take the zeros element and we ask, I don't know if I can do it. So let's do, oh, let's try. Ah, sorry. I'm zipping first. So that works. And I'm asking what, what's your type? Well, it tells me, okay, the first element of the tuple, oh, where's my mouse? The first element of the tuple is a, a list of characters and the second is B and B is a number and enumerable, right? I have some type constraints of what B can be, but it can be any enumerable number uh, because um, Haskell doesn't care. Uh, but the first one is a kind of a string. Right, so uh, the zip width. So the, the zip width is a little bit more complex because um, we produce a final list of an arbitrary type, right? Uh, so in a case of this first uh, L1, L2, right? Um, we have now kind of numbers which we paired up together, but we sort of um, uh, have tuples. And sometimes you want to like untuple them and just have kind of like a sequence of numbers instead of tuples, right? So what you can do is you can, instead of zip, like we, we did zip with L, L1, L2, but what you can do is you can kind of like combine it together and you can say, I have a function which takes X and Y, which is the elements of L and L, L1 and L2, and it produces uh, an array or a list which has X and Y, uh, and that is my behavior, and I am calling it on the L1 and L2. So if I call it like this, um, of course there is no comma, then you will see that again, I, I combined the first element of the list and second element of the list and so on. But now instead of tuples, I have lists, right? And with lists, then there is like an, an easy way of converting that list. Like, uh, so now I have a list, which is my result. So I have result two, oops. Result two. And the result two is this list of lists and I can concat result two and that kind of uh, concatenates all the elements and flattens for me the entire list, right? I cannot do that like for this one, for the tuples, for the list of tuples, I cannot really do that in a single call. I would have to map first to convert the uh, tuples to those lists and then to concat the lists, right? Uh, so sometimes zip width is, is your friend because then you can do it in a single operation, right? All right, um, let's do, uh, where is my mouse here? Let's do an exercise first and then I will talk about faults. Um, So now you you have you are passed a list of numbers, and your task is to sum up only the odd elements. How would you do that? Um, don't get hang out on the. Um, zips and folds, you don't need to use zips and folds for this one. Uh, the signature of the function is the function f takes a list of type a and produces um, 
a sum which is kind of a um, type A. And the type constraint is uh, that A is a number, right? But you can simplify it. You can say, uh, I don't care. I don't want to be generic. I want just to operate on ints. And then it would be like this, right? So we don't deal with floats or stuff like that. So you can, you can do this like this. And then you are giving a list, LST. And then how would you sum up only the odd items? All right, so first, this one is correct answer. So that's perfect. We basically taking advantage of the sum uh, and the sum, let's check what sum does. Sum uh, takes some con collection of some numbers and returns a single number, right? And given the name, uh, it returns the sum of those numbers. Um, Let's see if we can. Uh, that's not. Uh, that's not super helpful, but um, that's kind of enough. Uh, so this is fine. Uh, and then we have uh, odd. And what is odd? It's a. Uh, Unary function, which takes one argument, which is of integral type. Uh, there is a type constraint and returns a bool. So odd will give true if the number is odd and uh, false if it isn't. Um, so that's our test. It's our filter. This is our generator. We return all those odd numbers as a list and then we sum them. Perfect. So that is the same. This is the same, but we're doing the odd oddness manually, right? So instead of using the odd uh, primitive, we sort of are checking if the number uh, x is odd by checking if x modulo two is uh, one. Um, method of style, if you're coming from imperative programming, this might more appeal to you. If you are more uh, you know, uh, working with filters, this is nicer. Uh, one comment. Um, so let's can I copy that. Let me see. Yes, I can copy that. So let's do this. And then if I pass it um, a list of from one to ten, <laughs> it sort of does what it's supposed to do. Uh, my question is: uh, here we're using the filter in a kind of a, a prefix notation. Uh, how would you do that in a more natural style where the mod operator is actually infix? So how can we rewrite it such that it's an infix? Can, it, can anyone like type it here? That isn't. Yeah, so that's that would work, but that that would not work. So uh, let's use this. So there is a small trick that you need to do. So if you try to do this like this, then it will complain. There is a type mismatch and all the kind of the, the hell goes loose. You need to use ticks. Um, so anytime you have a binary function, which you normally use in the prefix notation, you can use it in the infix notation by using the fix, right? And then it will kind of work the same way, right? So use the kind of a back ticks uh, to convert it into this. And usually that's how people use it, right? So like, for example, diff, uh, diff is like a division, but if you say diff 102, 
It's like, it looks weird, right? Because we used to reading kind of a division in the infix notation. So normally in Haskell, you would write it like this, right? Um, so all the functions, especially the mathematical functions, which are binary, we usually write them, um, we write them like this. There is no difference. It's just a matter of style. Yeah, there is no, no real difference. Um, yeah. All right, great. So let's move on. Uh, we're getting to kind of an interesting one. So this one, that one was easy. Uh, I hope. Okay, the next one is super easy. How many we have left? Um, I'm not sure we're gonna finish. We have 13 minutes left and we're quite slow. But the next one is super easy. Perfect, the yellow is getting shorter. All right, so, okay. So now we have a list and we're passing N and we want to have, like, let me show you. So if I have a list, uh, let, let's call it F, um, F3 or F2, and I pass a list of one, two, right? What I want to get is I want to get a list which has one, one, and two, two. I want each element to be replicated n times. So how would you how would you get that? How would you get me a list with uh, each element of the original list replicated n times? As of course, as a one liner, you can do it in recursive calls. But we know now that it's not necessary. We have replicate, which is our friend. Then how would you get that? And we already have original list here, right? So we have one answer, but I, I think Mentimeter needs more than one to show them. So somebody please help. Very nice. So that is combining uh, replicate uh, and combining list comprehensions and concatenation. The second one is the same, but it uses, uh, yeah, so the, the second one is probably wrong slightly, but the concept is the same. So let me see. Oh, crap. So let's see if I try that. So let's uh, replicate uh, two, one, two. So, right, so I cannot force the type. Um, uh, yeah, so in any way, like if, if you look at the structure, uh, that is a list comprehension. And that will generate a list, which is kind of uh, a list because concat returns a list, right? So we already see that we will get kind of a, a list with a list inside and we don't want that, right? So uh, conceptually, th those two are very similar, but we want to concatenate at the end such that we get a flat list, right? So we want to get kind of a flat list out of the uh, list comprehension 
uh, such that we, um, yeah, let's see, let's move this one and do a type of, of F. So here we see it takes an int and an array of a list and then returns a list. And if I do the other one, if I do this one, no, this one, and if I do what is the type of F, you see that it takes an int and a list of lists and returns a list of lists. And that's not what we want, right? So the type doesn't match. So there is a small, uh, small mistake of what is the, uh, the type of the list and what is the type uh, return type. So the correct thing is kind of a uh, correct thing is this one, right? Uh, how else would you do this? What, what else could you do? You could, every time we're using list comprehension, you could use a map, right? So you could, um, yeah, let me show. So you could, instead of using a list of application, you could say concatenate a map of uh, replicate N on my list, right? So now the type of F is the same. It takes an int and a list and produces me a list. And if I call it with the, with this, the result is correct, right? So I, I of course, using the list comprehension is fine. Uh, it's probably cleaner, but you can you can use the the map um, as well, right? And it's also one liner, and it also deals with empty lines, right? So in both cases, uh, if we do an empty line, then it will work fine, right? How about we do zero? It also works fine. How about zero on non-empty list? Works fine. How about minus one? Something's gonna blow up. Yeah, so something blows up because the uh, some type constraints are violated by this being a negative. Oh no, wait, 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 wait. By I need to put it into this first. So that works also fine. The, the, man, the mistake was just with the minus. You remember the, the minus literals you have to put in brackets. All right, let's move on. So quickly, quickly. This one was good. I think we have two more, two more left. So you could use map, you can use list comprehension. Uh, concat and replicate are your friends. Um, and now after this one liner, uh, also think, um, very nice. Also think like, you know, doing this, doing this, um, it's pretty concise or, or even the, the, the map, the, the, this one, the list comprehension. Like it's a very clean kind of uh, easy to follow, easy to write code. Uh, and it's very concise way of doing it, of doing the task. And imagine how much boilerplate you would have to write in Golang if you were to rewrite it in Golang, right? How many lines of code you need to do to express the simple logic in Golang, right? And it kind of compounds. Um, so even for simple things, you already have some gains. And then the more complex domain you, you're working, the, the harder it gets. All right, so now we have mingle words. So you are given, uh, you, you, you need to write a program, which is not in the F uh, notation anymore. You basically need to write a program uh, using main, uh, which reads two things from the comma standard input and then produces kind of a mingled output, right? So it, well, you know, as you look at it, it's like, okay, it's zipping it, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of zips those two lists, right? So you read two strings from standard input and you print or stand, uh, uh, put string line, kind of the zip of those two. How would you do that? Uh, some hints. Okay, so mingle words. Everyone got the, the specification? So I will move to the, yeah, uh, typing your solutions. Um, some, some things that are useful. Um, so you will be doing main. 
and you will be doing do because you need to read uh, uh, so let's say I have an F. Oh come on, why you don't want me to type a block? No, it doesn't like. Yeah, anyway, so let's go to code. So you want to do this. Um, so you want to call uh, mingle, okay? Uh, and mingle doesn't take any parameters and it does do. And then you want to read two lines. So L1 and you want to do get line. Same for the second one, right? L2. And now you have two lists. Uh, and now you need to uh, zip them and then print the output. So this is kind of like the structure that you would like that you would do. Uh, I will prepare myself. So I will say mingle is exported. I will save it. And I will wait for you to solve this. Yeah, so one person already did it. One more. Please. It is kind of simple. Um, if you remember that uh, strings in Haskell are basically lists. So strings is kind of a syntactic sugar for a list of characters. So you can just zip two strings without doing much thinking. Um, and the only thing to get right is how you're gonna get the result, right? So if I, you know, if I zip, zip hello with world, it kind of uh, gives me the tuples and it's not what we want, right? We don't want the tuples. So, um, it, it's almost what we want, but now we need to do something with the, we either process it or we do the zip with trick, right? So if we do the zip with trick, then we don't need to, un, 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 uh, we can kind of um, unfold those tuples. So that's the kind of a little bit of a difficulty. Oh, there is a question, right. Good point, thanks. So let's see. Uh, okay. Um, uh, that's a good question. And for assignment one, you should not use um, the obvious choice, right? So for example, if the assignment tells you uh, define the length of the list and you use the length function, right? That, that's, then you're cheating. <laughs> but if the, uh, the question asks you to do something else and you need length to do this something else, then you can use length, right? Uh, but for length, don't use length because then you're not actually doing anything. You just, uh, you know, you, you're just saying, um, like, you know, if, if you say my length equals length, then uh, that's cheating. Then you, you're not doing it right. So then, you know, my length works. I can length a list of um, 11 items and it says 11, but that, that's not the point. Like the point is not just to redefine what length is, it's to define length using something else. Uh, if I ask you to define sum, uh, so my sum, then you should not use sum, but you can use length, right? If you have to, then it's okay. Um, so that, that's the kind of the answer to the question. So yes, you can use some of the uh, foldable uh, def defined things, but you should try to avoid them and you should try to use recursion and you should try to use kind of a more primitive things. Uh, and you can use the foldable things as well, 
to demonstrate that you sort of are able to express it in a more complex fashion, but try to not use like length for length or sum for sum. That, that, that would make no sense. You have to define it using different uh, functions. All right, so sorry, I, I thought those are answers. Those are answers, yeah. So here we have an answer, uh, which is not really the answer. All right, so let me show it quickly. Um, so as I was saying, okay, let me show it here. So uh, if we just do a plain zip, it kind of works, but not really, because we want this uh, string to be uh, parsed as an output, right? We could do a little bit more complicated things, like we can say, this is our result, and then we map um, a function which takes a tuple. So I will do pattern matching. It says it takes a tuple and produces a list of those uh, two items, right? So for each tuple, uh, out of the result, I am just now creating a list. Uh, and as you know, lists uh, of characters is a syntactic sugar for strings. So now I have this. And then if I do concat on this, right? So if I do concat on this, I will kind of end up with this string, right? Uh, that's how, how you could do it, but you still need to do this map. So you can do it all in one line. Um, if you replace this with this, right? So we're doing the zip first. So we're doing the, the zip first, then we're doing the map, and then we're doing the concat. Um, but because we have to do the map, uh, then maybe what we can do is we can kind of zip width first. And uh, if we do zip width, then we can kind of do that here already because zip width, right? So I'm basically zipping now this H with W and E with O um, using that function and kind of, <coughs> sorry, combining the two elements uh, with, the, with this kind of um, lambda function here uh, to achieve the behavior. And it's, you know, this one is better than doing this with the map. Right, it's shorter, more concise, and sort of simpler. Uh, so it's actually better to use zip width in this particular case. All right, so we are out of time. So I will just show you the the last one. Uh, so the last one is uh, actually uh, Haskell zero one function. So we haven't done it, but you will have to do it as a homework because Haskell one. Uh, is yeah basically um, compulsory and it says do not use the sum function right so try to use sum of all ints in a list and you can use recursion in which case you will not need to use anything but if you want you can use false and if you understand how false do how false work of course in one line you will kind of do that as a uh, as a fault right so here is the uh, the declaration, and then there are two uh, two lines: one for the empty empty list, and one kind of recursively does it. So this is done with recursion, and as you see here, we don't use any library functions at all. We don't need to use length or, or any 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 of that. So that's a good good answer. Perfect. Uh, so the sum turns out to be easier. The I thought the sum will be harder. And uh, zipping will, will be easier, but it seems I was wrong. Great, so that's all. Um, any other questions? So what we did today, we sort of reviewed some basics uh, of how to use some of the built-in functions, how to use some of the lists functions, list comprehensions. Uh, and that gives us a bit more work uh, items to work with more complicated concepts. And we will dive into a little bit more uh, on Wednesday. So we will dive a little bit more into some of the uh, more tracked um, concepts of Haskell. All right, so if there are no questions, I will wrap it up and close the stream. <laughs>